Hey friends, this is Pastor Joe from Southwest Lutheran Church, and I would like to share a great book with you today. This is one I've read recently. It's called Cities of God by Rodney Stark. And to help you see why this was valuable to me, let me share a little bit about myself. Back when I was thinking about whether I should become a pastor, I'll be honest, one of the things that really appealed to me about becoming a pastor was I felt like it would give me a reason to talk about my faith. I felt like it'd give me a reason to talk about the Bible. I think this is often kind of the feeling we have is if it's just plain old me, just plain old Joe, and I want to talk to my friends about Jesus. I want to talk about the Bible. I want to dig into a book of the Bible and tell people what it says. You know, just bringing that up, I think we feel like it would be awkward more than anything else, right? But here's the thing. If you're a pastor, that's what everyone expects you to do. And so I felt like, man, that'd be great because I just, I, I want to do this anyway. And if I can get to where people will just expect me to do it, perfect. <laughs> I don't have to have all the awkwardness, right? Now, here's the thing. I'll tell you, I am glad I'm a pastor. I'm glad I pursued that. I'm glad I'm serving right here where I'm at right now. But I had a mistaken idea there. And the mistaken idea I had was that God grows people in faith or that God brings people to faith either primarily, or even sometimes we think only, uh, through things like preaching, through pastors doing pastoral ministry. Let me say that again. My mistaken idea was that I thought God would really bring people to faith either primarily or even only through the work of pastors. And that's part of why I thought it would be so cool to, to be a pastor. And I don't want to take away from the good things that pastors do. Because we need pastors, and they are God's gifts to the church and to the world. You know, and to have people there whose, whose job it is to bring God's word and to bring God's sacrament to the people of God. Uh, that is a wonderful thing. I'm so glad I get to do that. But here's the thing. There's many more factors in someone's, say, conversion. Um, there's many more things that lead to a healthy life of faith. Uh, more than just a pastor preaching and teaching and, and doing sacramental work and all those sorts of things. There's a lot more that goes into it. And, and this is what Cities of God is really about. What are all the other things that go into creating communities of faith? Now, what this book is about is it's a work of history and it's, it's really, it's um, like statistical, it's, it's analytical, it's objective evidence sort of history, which is a little different from the way we often do history, because often the way we do history is we look at what people have written and, and we say, well, this is what happened. Or maybe what people have written and we say, well, this isn't really what happened, but it represents their viewpoint or the perspective they want to get across or something like that. But, but what's different about this is that Ronnie Stark would, would take data sets that have been compiled, and, and there were things like, say, inscriptions on tombstones. And, and you could track how quickly Christianity grew in a certain city within the Roman Empire by how many Christian inscriptions you see on tombstones, and when they start showing up, and, and when they become more numerous, and things like that. And so he was able to take these data sets and come up with a pretty, uh, you know, objective measure of how quickly Christianity was spreading. And then doing that, he was able to look at all sorts of correlations, all sorts of connections between different factors, and how quickly or slowly did Christianity spread in the early church era. And so some of these are pretty obvious. You know, for example, if you're closer to Jerusalem, Christianity got there earlier. If you were a major trade route or a port on the Mediterranean Ocean or something like that, then Christianity got there earlier because people were traveling through these areas. But he also came up with some very, I think we'd say, surprising conclusions as well. One of the conclusions he came to was that, say, the personal presence of the Apostle Paul didn't really make a difference in how quickly Christian communities spread. That's kind of surprising to us because we think of Paul as a great missionary, but here's the truth, right? There were many other Christian missionaries. There were many other ordinary people being Christians, doing the work of the church in and around these New Testament cities and, and, and locations and places we read about in the book of Acts, for example, right? There's lots of people involved in this work, and maybe it prompts us to think of someone like the Apostle Paul less as, you know, the guy who walked into town and, and started sharing the gospel when no one had ever heard of before, 
And we think of Paul as maybe someone who really knew how to leverage the work that other early missionaries had already done. Or we think of the Apostle Paul as, as a great organizer and, and networker and communicator. And then also, of course, right, we're thankful for his tremendous theological contributions in writing much in the New Testament. And we can give thanks for him in those ways and recognize the very important work he did. But it wasn't like he showed up and then all of a sudden just there's great, you know, revivals and conversions and, and I, they didn't have revivals then anyway, but you know what I mean. It's an interesting thing, but that's what the data shows. Um, another interesting thing that he saw was that Christianity would grow quickest in places uh, where it was a Greek or a Roman city. And it was already uh, had a significant population of, of Jewish people there. We call these diaspora Jews, people who had spread out from kind of the homeland, which was Jerusalem or Judah at different points in times, but where there was already a community of Jewish people there. And then Christians would bring the gospel to this small community of people who were living in, in, in a much larger sort of Greek or Roman community, a uh, city that was different from their small community, that actually created some very important social conditions where people uh, could imagine changing from the, the more traditional Hellenistic Judaism that they practiced to this new message, to following Jesus hearing the gospel, becoming Christians. And it's a really cool thing. It shows us how when you have, you know, one person who becomes a Christian, then the people who are very close to them, socially speaking, maybe a spouse or close family members, um, they are much more likely to become Christians after the first. And it kind of shows how Christianity, uh, or any religion for that matter, can spread through networks of people. Uh, when people have strong social attachments to Christians and relatively weak social attachments to uh, others, right? It, it makes sense. They would become Christian uh, more often. Now, the point of all this is not to say that things like the Word of God uh, doesn't make a difference. It certainly does, and that is how God works through the Word of God and baptism. Those are the main working force in conversion, but here's the thing. There's a lot of other things going on. And I think we can say this. We can say that Jesus works through our words, Jesus works through our actions, and Jesus works through our relationships to bring faith to the people who don't know him. So what do we do with that? Well, I think that should be an encouragement for all of us to be a Christian where we're at, in our own lives, in our own communities, in our own places of work, it simply means that one of the best things that you can do is you can be a Christian right where you're already at. So, you know, do Christian things with the people you already know. Um, here's a good example. When you have a friend who talks about something difficult in their life and they're hurting or they're just stressed, right? We can offer to pray and say, hey, you know what? What I do about something like that is I pray about it. Can, can I pray with you right now? Can I pray for you right now? And I'll tell you, when I've said it that way, I've uh, never had someone say, no, don't pray for me. It's a simple way that you can do a Christian thing for a friend. And that helps them to see who you are. And it helps them to see the kind of care that Christians can offer. Maybe you can invite someone over to dinner. If you have people join you for supper sometimes or have community gatherings or things like that in your home, parties. Uh, you know, just say, hey, we're going to eat, and, and here in our home we pray before we eat. Would you pray with us real quick, if you're comfortable? A great way to be a Christian in, in a setting you're already part of, right? Um, maybe another good example is you can serve your community. Do some good, right? Uh, care for people who need it. And even as you're doing that, you can invite your friends, your neighbors to, to go and do that with you. And you can invite someone to a church event where you're serving. Or you could even just on your own, helping a neighbor, hey, I'm helping out so-and-so today. Can you come with me and help me too? And you can show people the kind of person you are and let them know that you're a Christian through things like prayer and, and just not hiding it, right? And then that will let them see some of the good things that Jesus has done in you. Now, of course, you can also invite people to church. And that's great because we know, like I said, really the real work of conversion, you know, you can't do it without the word of God and baptism. So we got to get there eventually. But just recognize that inviting someone to church, it may be a bigger ask than you realize. Church can be a place where many people aren't comfortable, um, either because they've just never been there or because even they've had bad experiences in, in a church before. 
So just recognize that and, and, and recognize that one of the best things you can do is just be a Christian and don't hide it with the people uh, with whom you already live and, and with the people with whom you already care about. One of my favorite quotes from another writer, this is from a man named Greg Finke. Uh, he says this, you know, uh, when it comes to missionary work, Jesus does all the hard stuff and we get to do the easy stuff. It's Jesus who does the work of converting someone and bringing them to saving faith. And we get to do things like, well, spending time with people already in our lives who may not be Christians. We get to do the easy stuff like caring about them, praying with them in their needs, serving them in their hardships, and, and, and just being a good person. And when we do these simple things and we love our neighbors as Jesus calls us to love them, well, we know that Jesus is working. And I think that's good news for you and me and our communities, our neighbors. So I'd love to know what you think. If you've uh, read this or if you'd like to, if you've got any thoughts or questions, I'd love to answer them. So throw them in the comments down below. Until next time, I hope this is a blessing. Take care and God bless.